So how does, we, how does Bill Gates become a good guy? He leaves Microsoft and starts a foundation. Oh, that's good, because he's not making money anymore. <laughs> now he's a good guy, because he's giving it all away, because giving your money away, that's good. Making it, creating it, changing the world, eh, we don't really like that. I mean, think about how perverse that is. How many people is he going to help by giving his money away? I mean, maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, not billions. He's not going to change the world. Philanthropy has never in any way changed the world. Anyway. But now we perceive him as a good guy. Not a saint. Why is he not a saint? It's that smile problem. He seems to be having fun. He's enjoying giving his money away. He takes it as a challenge and he's doing it kind of thoughtfully, if you will. And he invests and he lives in a big house and he flies to Africa on a private jet. Saints don't fly private jets. So what would it take for Bill Gates to be a saint? He'd have to stop smiling, which means he'd have to give up his house. If we could move into a tent, that would be good. And at the end of the day, he has to show us a little bit of blood. Then we'd say, none of us would want to be Bill Gates, right? But we'd say, yes, now he's ready for sainthood. Like, none of us want to be Mother Teresa. But in our minds, we still think Mother Teresa, ooh, saint. That's good, morally. She sacrificed for the sake of other people, right? She was miserable. Yes, that's good. Which she was. Just read her diary, and you'll see how miserable she was. But that's the essence of virtue. That's what we've been taught by religion, by philosophy, by our mothers who learn it from philosophy and religion. For 2,000 years, we have been taught that suffering is virtue if you're doing it for other people, if you're doing it for a greater cause than yourself. That being selfless is the essence of morality and any tinge, any tinge of self-interest is bad. Augustine Comte, the French philosopher of the 19th century who coined the term altruism, said that if you help somebody else and by helping him, you, you say, oh, I'm going to feel good by helping this person. You know, it's going to make me feel good because I'm helping them. It doesn't count. It doesn't count as more moral because you have to help another person for the 100% sake of the other person. Now, let me postulate that that is a morality that is inconsistent with capitalism, inconsistent with markets, inconsistent with liberty, inconsistent with freedom. Everybody knows, everybody knows that markets and capitalism are about self-interest. It's about making money and having fun, in a sense. Enjoying oneself, fulfilling oneself, doing something meaningful with one's life. It's about the values you choose for you. Everybody knows this. So nobody, nobody wants capitalism. It's ugly. It's immoral. It's offensive. It's a bunch of selfish people going around doing their own thing for themselves. That's immoral. That's the essence of immorality. Indeed, this morality of sacrifice this morality of other people, otherism, of selflessness, is 100% consistent with which political economic system? Feudalism. What's that? Feudalism. Feudalism or socialism. Socialism or communism, right? Sacrifice, you want sacrifice? Communism is the best at that. Like 200 million people were sacrificed with communism. Right? They're good at sacrifice. Socialism is just as good. Sacrifice babies in Venezuela every day. For the greater good, for the cause, for the grandeur of the proletarian one day. You know? That's, that's the morality that drives us towards socialism. It's about sharing. It's about being nice. It's about caring about other people. It's about giving, not expecting anything in return. It's, this is, these are all wonderful words that are really consistent with socialism. 
So at the end of the day, people are not driven by economic ideas. At the end of the day, people are not driven by their pocketbook, by what will make them money. People are driven by what will make them feel good about themselves. And that is morality. That is ethics. People are driven by their ethical code. And this is why every time we achieve some freedom, I asked, uh, I asked uh, one of the architects of Chilean, uh, um, you know, the, the capitalism in Chile, I asked him, why is this turning around? Why is it going the other way? And he said, because the people who have been successful now feel guilty. Why do you feel guilty? Where does guilt come from? It comes from living one kind of life, but believing you should be Mother Teresa. And getting to the age of 50 or 60 or 70 and looking back on your life and saying, yeah, I've made a lot of money. I've sent my kids to college. I've done all these things. But you know what? I didn't live a Mother Teresa life like that's what my mother taught me. That's what the preacher said in church. That's what my philosophers taught me in class, that that is real virtue. So what have I done? So let me vote to raise my taxes. Let me vote to redistribute my wealth. Let me vote to reduce my guilt. And it's exactly what they do. Rich people vote to raise their taxes all the time. Rich people vote for the welfare state. Rich people vote to have themselves regulated. Because that's the other part of... That's the other part of, um, of, of, of self-interest, right? What do we think when we say selfish? That person's selfish. He's self-interested. What have they taught us to think? He's a lying, cheating, stealing SOB. You know what SOB means? <laughs> Ask somebody later. Right? He's a really bad person. He behaves badly. We've associated the word of self-interest with bad behavior. So... What's a businessman? A businessman is somebody who pursues his self-interest. So he must be a crook. We just haven't caught him yet. We will. My mother told me every millionaire in the world is a crook. She believed that. Because that's what her morality dictates. He's self-interested, therefore he's a crook. So I don't have a lot of time, so let me, let me, uh, let, let me position it this way. We, we're faced in the world in which we live in today with two options. Morally, ethically, philosophers teach us two options. You can live for the sake of others. You can be selfless. You can sacrifice. And that is nobility and goodness and everything else. That's altruism, if you will. Or you can be selfish, which means a lying, stealing, you know, horrible human being. Nobody wants to be that. Ayn Rand is part of Ayn Rand's genius is to take those kind of distinctions and say, wait a minute, are those the only two options? That can't be right. And she does this in every, almost every field. She takes, a, you know, a, a kind of a, 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 a one perspective and then another perspective, and she says, neither one are right. Here's the right one. Right? And she says, wait a minute, why can't I be self-interested, pursue my life without exploiting other people, without being a mad, mean person. And indeed, she says, if you actually figure out what drives self-interest, what self-interest actually means, what your interest is as a human being, then exploiting other people, lying, stealing, and cheating is actually self-destructive not self-interested. It actually hurts you and harms you. And if you want examples, ask me in the Q&A, right? But just think about somebody who's a systemic liar. What happens to them? They get caught and nobody wants to have anything to do with them and they live a miserable, pathetic life. Think about crooks. Yeah, they get the money, but they live in constant fear of being caught and ultimately they go to jail. Or even if they don't get to go to jail, they never really enjoy the money. You know who enjoys money? People who make it not people who steal it. So she says, wait a minute, this is bogus, this dichotomy. There's, yes, there's altruism, which she considered evil. Yes, there's self-destructiveness, which is all these other things we talked about. And then there's real self-interest. And what is real self-interest? If, if you care about yourself if, 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 as a human being, what is the thing 
that makes human life possible? What is it that makes us human? What is it that makes every value, everything in this room possible? Reason. Reason. You can't have clothes without reason. Somebody had to figure out how to take cotton and turn it into cloth. I have no idea how to do that. And I guess there's nobody in this room has any idea how you do that. And never mind how to skin an animal, dry its pelt, and then somehow turn that into clothing. Some genius came up with that. Or agriculture, or hunting, or building weapons to, to, to hunt, or any, any of the basic things, or building a hut. Put me in the forest and tell me you gotta build a hut. I don't know how to build a hut. I mean, I really have to think about it. We are a unique animal. We don't have the means by which to survive programmed into us. We have to figure it out. We have to use our reason. We have to use our thought. So Ayn Rand says, if you care about your own life, if you want to be self-interested, if you want to live the best life that you can live, what is the number one value you must pursue? It's your mind. You must use your reason. You must figure out what is necessary for me in order to survive, to thrive, to succeed, to be the best that I can be at living a life. And she said living is not just about, you know, being an, living as an animal. It's about living as a human being, as a full-fledged human being with everything that is made possible because of our cognitive abilities. It means using our mind to make our life wonderful, to flourish, to experience life to the fullest. Not to settle, not to compromise, not just to be like everybody else, but to live our lives. You have one shot at this. I'm not a Buddhist. And even if I would, I'd be worried about returning as a cockroach, right? So you've got one opportunity to live life as a human being. Ayn Rand says, jump on it, embrace it, live it, and use your mind to do it. And then she says, okay, so we have to use our mind to figure out what was good for human beings. Now the question is, what are the values and what are the virtues that are going to make this possible? And to her, ethics, morality is a science, like Aristotle. It's a science to determine the values and virtues that human beings must embrace in order for them to survive and to thrive. That's it. That's what ethics should be about. But nobody does ethics like that. Ethics teaches us today how to die and struggle and suffer, not how to live and thrive and succeed. Ethics should be what you teach in business school so that people go out and know how to make money. Because making money is an ethical endeavor because it's about creating values in win-win transactions. So what kind of society the people who value their own life, who value their own reason, want? And this is kind of the bridge between our ethical system and a free society because you need that bridge. But before I do that, I just want to make it clear. The ethics we live in today is 100% consistent with socialism. And unless we challenge it, we will never have capitalism. And a little bit of flirtation we had with capitalism, maybe in the 19th century, maybe in Hong Kong, doesn't last because at some point, some uh, bleeding heart altruist will say, oh, this is too selfish. And these people are bad people. We have to control them. We have to regulate them because otherwise they'll lie, steal, and cheat. Lie, steal, and cheat. So if you think about reason, what is the enemy of human reason? What's the thing that makes reason impotent? Fear. Well, fear can be overcome. This cannot be overcome. Force. 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 A gun. I put a gun to the back of your head. Forget about thinking. Because all you care about at this point is what I have to say. I tell you 2 plus 2 equals 5, and you have to live by that. You can't build a bridge. You can't program a computer. You can't do anything. You're shut down. Force, coercion, authority shuts the human mind down. It's not an accident that the scientific revolution happened in parallel to more and more and more liberty in society. Because if you were a scientist, 
in the 15th century and you discovered something that contradicted the Bible, what happened to you? If you, yeah, you were burnt at the stake. So luckily Galileo came a little bit later and he was only put under house arrest. And then by the time Newton comes around, we've already accepted the idea that, yeah, okay, you can, you can challenge the Bible. We still don't quite believe you, but we can challenge the Bible. We'll leave you alone. It's the ideas of liberty that make science possible. And then post-Newton, boom, science explodes because suddenly there's this freedom. There's this liberty to challenge the status quo, to challenge authority, to, 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 to not be coerced. You mentioned producers, aside from those people who give us intellectual products. What about the businessman? You talked about capitalism. I'd like to know his role in this. Well, the businessman also is as recent a product as the intellectual. Before the birth of capitalism, there were no professional businessmen, and there were no professional intellectuals. Both the mind and material production and trade were enslaved and ruled by the various combinations of Attilas and witch doctors, which means by a powerful government, by an absolutist type of government, whether it was the feudal absolutism or the absolute monarchies of Europe of the past Renaissance period. In any case, the producers of material goods, the traders, and the producers of ideas, the teachers, philosophers, the early scientists, were men without official status, without a profession, and the total mercy of the political rulers, which means that the mercy of rule by force. Oh. It is only since the Industrial Revolution, the birth of a pre-society, the society of capitalism, that there was a new class of men, which is the free producers of material goods, the businessmen, the industrialists. They, of course, are the producers, in the strict sense of the word, or should be. But they are the greatest victims of today's society, they are the ones who have been betrayed by modern intellectuals, and in this sense, both businessmen and intellectuals will commit suicide by destroying each other, and the fall belongs to the intellectuals. The businessman is the man who has to use his mind to deal with reality, to study facts, to produce material goods. He is the man who serves as the transmission belt of the discoveries of science, uh, and carries the product of science to all levels of society. He is the one who takes the invention of a theoretical scientist or of an inventor, transforms them into useful products, and uh, pu putting them into mass production makes them available to all levels of society. The businessman is the man who has achieved the enormous, historically miraculous rise in the standard of living of mankind during the 19th century. He is the one who has lived up to the role of a producer, uh, to the role of a rational, creative man. But the intellectuals have never given him credit for it, have regarded him as if he were an Attila, and being afraid of freedom themselves, have been looking from the start of the Industrial Revolution for some form of an Attila to protect them, the intellectuals, against the free market of ideas. Mm -hmm. Well...